Today we have one of the most requested channels for me to look at, and this is MGuy Australia. Without further ado, here is a video about EVs becoming more expensive from MGuy Australia. One of the main reasons for buying an EV, we were told, was that they were so much cheaper to run. That's true, but I sense some skepticism in your tone there, MGuy. Just think of all that money you'll save not having to fill your car with petrol or diesel, they said. Also true. In spite of all the inconveniences of EVs, you'll be saving money and that makes it all worthwhile, they said. I don't know what he's talking about inconveniences here and I don't know who they are, if he's some conspiracy theorist or not. But uh, definitely having an EV is a lot more convenient than having a gas car. If you think about it, you charge overnight at your home, or that's what most people do. Something like 90% of people in Australia, 80% of people in the U.S., so most people. Uh, and then from there on, there's far less maintenance, far less repairs, all those kind of things. And of course, yes, you do save money. So Because rising electricity prices and insurance costs are rapidly wiping out any financial benefit of owning an EV. That's a bold claim, but uh, I'm sure that the rest of the video is filled with just facts and information and no speculation or opinions, right? Right? The electricity price rises are due entirely to the same mad policies that are pushing EVs in the first place, net zero, which on the one hand forces us to buy EVs and on the other eliminates reliable baseload power generation from coal and gas and pushes the grid onto unreliable wind and solar and prices rocket as a result. Now that's a fair point if you're really into coal for some reason. I don't know if maybe he works for that industry or something, but Australia's Net Zero Authority has pledged to eliminate coal power in the country by 2035. And solar power is actually booming in Australia. About 3.6 million Australian households have rooftop solar. I'm guessing M Guy's household isn't one of them, but he really should be. They get a lot of sun down there. So much that according to geoscientists, the entire country could be run on solar 10,000 times over. And the largest solar farm in the world is being built in Australia right now, granted with the plans to export some of the power. Meanwhile, wind power accounts for between 7 and 11% of Australia's power, depending on what sources you check. Now, wind is expensive right now, but the same agencies trying to eliminate coal are working to get the price down by building capacity. It's kind of like building EVs, where it may be unprofitable at first, but once you reach scale, it becomes very profitable. So I think I could get behind M Guy being mad about wind, but solar? Dude, it's free. And insurance is a disaster for EVs and will get worse. Insurance companies are wising up to the fact that EVs are almost invariably totaled out in an accident and they're cranking up premiums in response. Okay, that is a persistent myth. Um, the fact is that wrecked EVs are not always totaled. In fact, they're totaled at a lower rate than gas cars. And Mitchell, a data compiler, actually put out a report on this recently showing that for EVs, it was a total loss rate of 7.25% for models 2020 and newer, whereas luxury ICE automobiles, which are similar because they're similarly priced was at 7.47% versus 8.49% for all internal combustion vehicles. So this is as close to uh, apples to apples comparison as I think we can get here. But what about the other part of M guys claim that insurance rates are higher for EVs? Now, the average cost of insuring an EV is due to the parts and the mechanics being sort of scarce. Those are both problems that should be going away in the next few years if the insurance companies play fair. Their rates will also go down along with this availability going up. So partial credit to MGuy for this one, but if you work it out across five years, the other savings on fuel, maintenance, and repairs still pencil out to be a much better deal overall. Nice try, though. Unless you have the relative luxury of off-street parking and the ability to charge an EV in your driveway, you are going to find EV ownership a very tiresome and wallet-emptying experience. It's funny. He always ends the statements like with this scowl, this kind of weird look. Uh, M Guy is in Sydney, Australia, which is a big city. Probably not much opportunity to charge up in your own garage if you live in a big city. I get that. It's a complaint that urbanites around the world have, but it doesn't really seem to stop a lot of people. If you look at how many people in, say, New York or London have EVs, it's pretty high. Now, let's just see how hard it is, though, to find a station in Sydney where he lives. 
The government actually has some information on this. Uh, it appears that there are over 310 EV stations in Sydney, which isn't huge, but it's not nothing. And if you look from PlugShare, we have an actual map that we can zoom in on those and see the different types of charging stations and uh, the different rates and all those kind of things and all the ratings. And the New South Wales government does have plans to set up charging for four vehicles per five kilometers in urban areas, and it's investing millions to make that happen. But more importantly, he's talking about the luxury of having a place to charge at night. And I think he's misrepresenting the facts there. I don't know if he's doing it intentionally, if he's just talking about his own situation. But when you look at Australia, something around 83% of all Australians live in places where they would have a place to charge at night, either that being a home or it being a townhouse. So this would actually make Australia one of the better situations when it comes to off-street parking. Not only will you have to queue and wait for your EV to charge at a public charging station, assuming it's working that is, but also you'll be paying through the nose for every kilowatt hour you use. Public EV charging costs rise to rival petrol. Yeah, in all my research I've done, I've never found that to be true. So again, another bold claim here, I mean kind of the point of his whole video, so I really hope he has some solid data. I really hope so. Charging is slightly cheaper, 53 cents per kilowatt hour, during overnight off-peak periods, which start at 9 p.m. and finish at 10 a.m. Wow, and who wouldn't want to charge their EV at three in the morning, right? This actually makes me think that he's never been in an EV before, which explains a lot. Uh, but to his point, uh, everyone would want to charge their EV at 3 a.m. when electricity is cheap, as he's pointing out from this article. The thing he's missing, uh, unlike a gas car, you don't have to be there physically to charge it, unlike you have to be there when you fill up gas. You schedule it within the car, and you just plug it in and then go to sleep. So while you're sleeping, hopefully, around 3 a.m., the car is doing its thing. It will start and stop charging all automatically. And the funny thing is he's actually pointing out one of the main benefits of owning an EV here without even knowing it. Oh, you, you can't make this stuff up. But please, continue with the garbage. Recharging the 60 kilowatt hour battery of a popular medium sized EV such as the BYD Atto 3 could cost $55 for about 390 kilometers of range. Compare that to a Toyota RAV4 with a 55 litre tank that costs $1.80 per litre to fill or about $100 for a full tank returning more than 800 kilometers of range. And EVs can start to look like a tough sell. Okay. Finally, we have some data, and this is another case of just cherry picking that data. They're taking that 92 cent rate for the highest possible Tesla supercharger rate and using it like it's the norm, like that's the standard of what everyone else will pay. Of course, that's not true. Now, when I actually looked at this, because using the Tesla app, I can pull up superchargers to charge non-Tesla EVs. They're talking about a BYD Auto 3, which I don't know what that is, but not a Tesla. Um, I look, I find one in Sydney in uh, Chatswood, New South Wales, I think it is. Uh, and what I can see is that when I look at the price here, it's not 92 cents. It's 70 cents per kilowatt hour, which is a substantially lower amount. And that's for non-members. So if you subscribe at $12.99 a month, it drops down to 48 cents per kilowatt hour, far lower than the 92 cents that they originally quoted. So they're sort of just making up numbers here, which are just not based in reality, or at least not at the time of this recording. So let's see how this pencils out using real numbers, not imaginary ones. Let's start by looking at the latest census data from the Australian government, which shows people driving on average 12.1 thousand kilometers per year. Honestly, that seems kind of low, but I guess everything's pretty close together there. So given that the BYD Addo 3 can reportedly travel 260 miles or 420 kilometers on a single charge, that means that you'll need to charge about two and a half times per month. With a 60 kilowatt hour battery and 48 cents per kilowatt hour, you're looking at about $29 per charge. That times two and a half plus the Tesla membership fee and you're paying around $86 per month for your EV fuel or about eight and a half dollars per 100 kilometers. Now compare that to the Toyota RAV4, which they claim costs around $8 per 100 kilometers. It's pretty close, but the thing is, I couldn't find these numbers anywhere unless you're talking about a hybrid RAV4, not a gas-powered one. 
When I go to the Australian Toyota website and I look, all they have are these hybrid electrics, which get 4.7 liters per 100 kilometers. And yes, if you do the math on that, you would be looking at about $8. In fact, it'd be closer to $8.50 per 100 kilometers, which is basically the same as the EV. But again, that's a hybrid, not the true gas counterpart, not apples to apples. And if you look at the actual fuel economy number here, there's this little note, G44. And if I scroll down, G44 is a note saying that the results were produced in laboratory test conditions using sample vehicles without fitment of accessories, customization, and do not reflect real world driving. Figures should only be used for comparative purposes, meaning that these are not real numbers. You can't trust them to be real world examples. And so what we need to do is look at some other data that actually has it for the gas version, not the hybrid electric version. We can get that from the EPA in the United States. Now here I'm able to pull up the gas version of the Toyota RAV4, not the hybrid electric one. And you can see that we have 30 miles per gallon. This is a combined miles per gallon is what we rate it as. And so if we do the math on that 30 miles per gallon for the RAV4, that comes out to 7.84 liters per 100 kilometers, not 4.7 like the other one claimed. So if you multiply that times the dollar 80 cents per liter, you're looking at over $14 per 100 kilometers, not $8. In other words, when using real numbers instead of imaginary ones, the gas car is nearly twice as expensive per 100 kilometers to fuel than the electric option. So even in this case, the worst case scenario where you're charging an EV at a fast charger during peak times and paying a membership fee to do so, the EV still wins by a landslide. In in reality, the most popular EV in Australia, for now anyways, the Tesla Model Y, wouldn't have to pay that fee. And if you're one of the many people there that have a place to charge at home, you'd pay even less. And in fact, even later in the same article, of course he left this out, uh, they interviewed Tim Washington, the chief executive of the EV infrastructure firm Jet Charge. He said, that we are lucky in Australia that so many people have ways to charge at home or work because it's not true globally. Australia is one of the highest penetrations of off-street parking in the world, about 70% if you include apartments. And about 90% of EV owners charge at home or work, and about 50% of those people will charge with solar. He continued, there are a lot of people who drive for free. So actually give credit to the author of this article here, uh, David McCowan, for telling a complete story. It's our YouTuber friend, MGuy, that just cherry picked the data he wanted to fit his narrative versus doing his own research, which is really the problem I see with his channel and so many of them like that. Electric car insurance premiums set to soar. Chinese made vehicles in particular could skyrocket after a new vehicle risk rating VRR system was rolled out last month. So now we're back in the UK. He's talking about the Telegraph and the Telegraph is talking about a change to the insurance rates in the UK, not Australia. Whereas the previous story and point he was making was all about Australia, where he lives. So he's really kind of combining these two things, even though they're not really able to be combined. I'm not sure if he understands uh, how that works, but insurance premiums in the UK shouldn't affect people in Australia that own EVs, just to be clear. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, uh, this headline here, uh, electric car insurance premium set to soar, is about as clickbaity and biased as they come. It mentions unnamed experts as its source, and then it goes on to name this guy Chris Rosamund of Auto Express Magazine without saying that he's one of the actual guys that are being lumped in with the experts earlier. Now, I looked up the comments from this guy, Chris Rosamund, on a different site, a blog called This Is Money. He said, that previously car insurance was based on the more generic one to 50 group rating system, but factors such as an influx of Chinese EVs with insufficient spare parts, backup, and a lack of critical repair information or the introduction of expensive to fix tech such as LED headlamps or driver assistance systems were making it increasingly hard for insurers to assess the risk accurately. As a result, premiums have skyrocketed and we're all paying for this knowledge gap. Did you catch that? Did you notice something unique about what he's saying there? The true quote, is all in past tense. These things have already happened. The skyrocketing of rates has already occurred. So the Telegraph article is saying this is set to soar, meaning in the future. However, the true quote that this guy gave was all about stuff that had already happened. He's trying to, again, really bait and switch it here and mislead by comparing two things that are just not comparable. And none of this addresses the other financial elephant in the room namely depreciation. You might save a bit on petrol, but if you're losing 20k a year in depreciation, as many will be on EVs, that loss will swamp any possible benefit of fuel savings. 
I'm not sure what sources he has here. 20K per year obviously isn't real. Uh, maybe in the first year, but that's not year after year. Otherwise, the whole thing would be depreciated in the first few years. Uh, my sources here are PodPoint and Wired. And of course, these, along with every other thing you see here in every video I do, you can find a link to in the description just below the like button with all the sources listed. So if I miss something, if something's inaccurate, please let me know in the comments down below because that is the whole point of this channel is to push back on all this fear, uncertainty, and doubt with facts and information. But the truth is, is that according to PodPoint, anyways, EVs do depreciate rapidly after the first 12 months. After that, the rate declines and it's roughly equal to a gas car. Popular EVs like the Model 3 and premium models like the Porsche Taycan or the Mercedes or BMWs do hold their value longer. And Wired back in August posted this article saying that EVs are losing up to 50% of their value within the first year. And there's that old saying that it loses 50% of the value when you drive it off the lot. That was true before EVs existed. Just keep that in the back of your head. Now, the examples that Wired used were the Audi e-tron and Ford Mustang Mach-E. And confusingly, they said that they found the Model 3 had dropped in resale nearly as much. The two caveats to keep in mind was that EVs generally had higher than average mileage for the first year vehicle. And the valuations were done for trade-ins, not private sales. On the other hand, comparisons show that high mileage gas cars can hold their value better than EVs. The Wired article blames customer worries about replacing the battery and the FOMO that comes from wanting the latest update instead of a used EV. Now the battery thing is basically a myth. I've talked about it here many times. The batteries are warrantied for 100,000 miles or more from basically everybody. And of course you can buy extended warranties and all that, but the data we have is showing that they last well beyond that. So it's really not a concern, although I think it's a perception that people have out there. Now, wanting to get the latest and greatest because EVs are very tech oriented, I can understand that. And I do think that that does drive down the price of used EVs, but this is a good thing. Buying a new car is never a good financial investment. It's always gonna depreciate. It's always gonna be a bad move. And the first person to buy it is gonna be the one that takes the biggest hit. So if you're smart with money, you probably shouldn't be buying a new car anyways, unless you're just filthy rich, in which case, who gives a crap? But the point is, is that used EV prices are coming down but the batteries and the tech and everything in them are still fantastic. And if you look at a company like Tesla, they don't change the, the tech in it year by year. It changes sort of gradually or at different times. It's not like the 2023 versus the 2022 is that much different. In fact, my wife's 2020 Tesla Model Y is very, very similar to a brand new one that you can get today. So used EVs are a great deal and absolutely something that everyone should be considering when you're looking to buy an EV. This all goes to show that one of the main arguments in favor of EVs, the savings that you can make, is really just an illusion. Electricity prices will continue to rise in the face of net zero, as will insurance premiums, at the same time as your EV's value is plummeting because, let's face it, nobody in their right mind would buy a used EV. He's probably not going to like this video, I take it. Uh, mostly because we've just proven that he's wrong. Uh, EVs are, in fact, a lot cheaper to own and operate than a gas car. And his claims about the insurance or is going to wipe out those savings is baseless. It's not even from the same country that he's in. So he's taking two different things and trying to compare them when they're not comparable. It's a false equivalence. Uh, it's like saying that the price of avocados in Hawaii is high, so guacamole in Mexico is set to soar. He's really grasping at straws here, using classic misinformation tactics, such as misdirection, deceptive imagery, persuasion, or dip, as well as false equivalencies. It's just really sad to see, and I feel bad for the guy whose whole identity is wrapped up in hating on EVs when he's clearly going to lose this fight in the long run. But maybe this explains why he was so excited to sit down with arguably the worst British prime minister in history, who didn't even last as long as a head of lettuce. Check my sources down below if you're not sure what I'm talking about. The bottom line here, my guy or M guy or Simon isn't telling the truth. He's found success online by spreading lies and misinformation about EVs, and he's gone all in, even shilling merch with this clip art logo uh, of an EV with a charger sticking out of it with a line through it. Or at least maybe that's what he thinks that they look like. I don't know. Now, if his arguments were the least bit based in fact, I would give him credit for having a different viewpoint than I and having a real discussion. But that's not what we see here. We see a lot of him bringing his feelings way too much into this discussion, bashing politicians, talking about the net zero movement, when really we all know that the facts don't care about your feelings, Simon. If you want to help flush out fear, uncertainty, and doubt, or FUD like this, 
check the link down below where you can become a FUD fighter and help elevate the conversation by bringing facts and data to the discussion. Because I think we all know that without data, you're just another person with an opinion. And I really hope we can agree that we don't need more of those on the internet. Also, if you want to learn more, check out this video over here where I analyze the data behind EV fires and the real risk that they pose. Plus, don't forget to check out my daily podcast where I cover the latest EV news five days a week. That's it for this one, guys. Let me know what you think in the comments, and I'll see you back here next time.